Why keep pushing? Because otherwise I feel dead. Teddy. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome to Thank the Madhouse. So Thank you so much. Wow. So, I want to first establish this for everybody. Now, mm -hmm. MBNF, some are, I'm sure, familiar, but what is MBNF? <laughs> MBNF is a life decision. It's, it's a company I started 18 years ago mm -hmm. called Maximilian Busser and Friends, and everybody told me at that time it's like the worst name ever. And um, the whole idea is I want to be proud of myself the last day of my life. I want to look back as a creator. I create only what I believe in. And I just want to stress this. Is, this is just my opinion, but I think you're one of the most important people we have in this industry because what you represent, and you're going to see a lot of crazy watches here today, but it's beyond the craziness. What I admire about you and your work is it's, it's a pursuit of just asking why further and further mm -hmm. and just pushing. So even if some of these watches you're seeing today are not for you, I think we have to admire the work you're doing, just from my own personal experience. So I, I admire what you're doing. I'm excited to go through this. Can we also explain F. What does F mean? So, friends. Okay, yes. I would have written Max Booster and people who share the same values. The acronym would be a little bit long. It just means that I have these ideas, these weird ideas. I used to be a weird kid and now I'm a weird adult. And from there, I surround myself with all these people, the friends, mm -hmm. could be internally in the company. I started the company all alone in my little flat uh, 18 years ago. I was two and a half years alone in the flat. Then we were two, then we were three, now we're going to be 50. And it's all the artisans around us, and we always credit everybody who works with us. Mm -hmm. It's treat people the way you want to be treated. I made it a mantra. This space, this is a new space for you all. I mean, it's not technically it's not, a new <laughs> technically space. Technically not new. Like yeah. The structure itself, but what it is the place that we're sitting in right now? And then I'd love to be able to get a walkthrough, see some of the work that's being done here. As well. Sure. So, as, as the most important thing was always for us to create great products. We put everything we had in creating great products. We had usually pretty horrible workshops and, and offices. We didn't spend any money that because it had to go into that next movement each time. And at some point we needed to grow. And wherever I went, I would see these big plateaus. And I just felt so depressed thinking this is so horrible. And one day we arrived here. This was a pretty derelict house. It was built in 1907. We spent a year and a half to refurbish it and it's, um, it's become our mad house, mad me mechanical arts devices, mad galleries, mad editions, mad house, um, where we've basically put all the family here except the machining. We've got the workshops where we machine all the components are outside. Clearly we couldn't put five ton CNC mm -hmm. machines on this place. Uh, and so um, we're very proud to come here in, in September and it changed the vibe of the company also. Everybody like feels like it's a beehive. It's you can hear it. Huh? All the work, yeah, people yeah. going up and down. Um, it's the place I dreamt of, but I didn't know about. So work is being done here. Could we start to see a sure. walk through the space? I'd love to. Let see me show more. you a few things. Okay. Come. All right. So this was a, basically a house where people lived, and uh, so this was the entry, and then we're going into the sitting room and the dining room. Huh. Right. So here the, the place is pretty amazing when you look at it. It's, what was this room before? This was the uh, part of the sitting room and dining room. Dining room was actually where the watchmakers are assembling now. Huh. Here we have part of the watchmakers, the um, laboratory, because we keep on improving on every piece. I mean, we've come out with 20 calibers in 17 years. That's insane. One to two calibers. And we're not talking of just simple, we're talking super complex. Everything is starting basically from the ground up every single time. Exactly. Do you, and do you ever just, think, I mean, I know what your answer is probably going to be or something of this sort, but why? Why keep pushing? Because otherwise I feel dead. <laughs> because otherwise I feel I'm, I'm not alive. Um, hmm. And actually, I'm in a world which is very weird because we have so many ideas, I have so many ideas, and it's incredibly frustrating because it'll take anywhere between three and five years to transform that idea into reality. Hmm. Um, so we're now working on products which will come out in 2031, 2032. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be like nearly 70 years old. <laughs> and the ideas I've had now, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to see them in 10 years. Mm -hmm. I want to see them now. But that's the life of a watchmaker. I, I love this because most people don't realize how complex it is to do a watch. Now, you visited other factories, you know how it works. 
you usually start with an ingot of metal. And from there, multiple, multiple, multiple operations later. For example, here we have the internal case of an HM8 Mark II. These are all made in-house. Uh, it could also be from an ingot like this. Mm -hmm. You'll end up with a legacy Evo case. That's already super complex, but then you get into the most complex, which are the base plates. So a base plate starts with this and you will end up with something which has over 500 operations into this plate. And every single one is often at a micron, mm -hmm. because if you've got one hole set a micron different, it won't work. So this is the heart. And we always talk of the, the, the balance wheel and the escapement, of course, the heart which is working. But the heart of a movement starts with the base plate with all these incredible amount of operations. So how many watchmakers do you have working out of the facility here? Now we have nine watchmakers here mm -hmm. assembling uh, the movements. What's incredible is that we have seven full R&D engineers. Hmm. So we have virtually as many R&D engineers as watchmakers. I think there are no, no watchmaking company in the world has that ratio. And then what's the split up of time? I mean, the con there's a concept, then there is starting to design, uh, design and make those you know, CAD files and actually think about the engineering of it, and there's the actual engineering. Like, how do you split up that cycle of time? Like, how does that look for a product going from idea to end? So the idea to the design of the 3D print mm -hmm. could take anything from two weeks to five years. It depends. As long as we're not happy, there'll be iterations. And sometimes I stop projects because I just it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it can be like, wow, like that aha moment. moment. From there onwards, R&D could be any time between two and three years. At the end, you're doing your prototyping. You're doing your, your pre-series manufacturing all the components and then at the end, really at the end, it's assembled here. Hmm. So um, we are working on pieces which will come out in five years that the team here will only see in five years. While they're working on, well we've still got about eight calibers in parallel, which is crazy, we craft approximately 30 to 35 uh, movements or watches a month here mm -hmm. and over eight calibers. So like we will do three to five of each caliber every month and, uh, and that really makes no economical <laughs> sense at all, but that's who we are. So that's what's happening. Now we're seeing the assembly happening in this exactly. room. And could you describe the philosophy of assembling? Because you know, when you go into larger brands, uh, you know, they say T02, 1, T2, you see that all kind of assembly line process, right? Agreed. Passing it off to the next watchmaker to do the next task. Here, it seems like there's a more intimate, intimate connection to the watches that are being made. Let's go and see a watchmaker. Okay, let's, let's do it, please. So, so for us, there is one point which will never change. Every watchmaker will assemble his or her movement from scratch. Hmm. Being a watchmaker is, is being a detective, is being incredibly talented at our level, and it's being very romantic. You, you get three, 550 to 600 different components. You're going to take days and weeks assembling painstakingly that movement, which is your movement. And at the end of those weeks, you wind it up and the heart starts beating. It comes alive. It's your movement. It comes alive. And that's something which will never change at MBNF. And what's incredible is not only is that, but every single, we're very lucky, every single of our watchmakers has been with us from the beginning, meaning as soon as they arrived, and every, nobody's ever left the company. Hmm. So if a client comes to us and with their MBNF, we'll take their watch off the wrist, look at the serial number and say, oh, you know who did it's it. Josh, oh, it's Manu, mm -hmm. oh, it's Anne, and so on. And you can actually meet today, every time you come and visit us, you can meet the person who assembled your watch. That means a lot for me. What's typical assembly time for one of your pieces? If one watchmaker sits down, they're working, you know, say seven, eight hours a day, what, how many days? It, it will be anything between, uh, I'm going to say five to 15 days, depending on the complexity. Oh. Wow. Um, and of course, then there are more complex watches to, um, to uh, test, for example. Mm -hmm. Take our Legacy 2 with two flying balance wheels. The, the, the good old Vici, which you put the watch on and you can give you your amplitude and rate, mm -hmm. doesn't work because it's got two hearts. So there you have to actually keep it on your bench and look at it 
for the next couple of weeks and see if it's precise or not. And if it's not, you disassemble it, try and find what's the issue and start again. So there's a real detective work of being a watchmaker. Have you noticed as a type of person that gravitates toward MBNF? Like if somebody's looking at this for the first time, and after this, I will mean, we'll see a couple of their stops, and I want to see some of these pieces, and I'd like to introduce that to uh, the people sure. that are watching. Who, what have you recognized? The people that get it versus don't get it? You know? So for 15 years, I traveled the world to try and find people who would actually resonate on the same wavelength, and um, it was tough. It was tough, uh, and but those who did resonate became crazy about the brand. We have so many clients have got two, five, 10, 20 MBNFs because they found their family, they found the story resonated with them. And, and from there, what did we see? They were mostly watch geeks, for sure. People who are really knowledgeable. They usually, it's interesting, they're usually entrepreneurs and they're usually people who are incredibly self-asserted who don't care if people recognize what they wear. They don't want to show off. Nobody knows what you have when you're wearing this. Nobody knows the price and nobody's jealous. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you're wearing something for yourself. And those are our clients. Now, of course, in the last three years where independence became suddenly so visible, we started getting other customers who were maybe more into watches which are very well known. And like, you know what? I've done that. I want to go to the next step. And we welcome them if we have enough watches. That's the another issue, is that what's happened is that we've kept all, as many watches as we could for those who supported us the first 15 years. Hmm. And suddenly we had 10 times more clients come in in the last two years. And we're keeping like maybe 20%, 25% for new clients. But we're talking, what, 100 watches? 50 to 100 watches for new clients and got thousands who want them. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, conundrum, that one. Uh, we haven't solved that one yet. So Emmanuel here is in one of the final stage of the assembly of a sequential chronograph, which is super complex. And he's here adapting the, the height of one of the uh, rubies. Mm -hmm. So he had actually positioned it, saw that it was not the right height, now taken the bridge off, repositioned it. Hmm. it it's this whole detective work, hmm. which is not only talent and experience, you need that, that innate feeling of what could go better, what could go wrong. So this is the R&D um, room. We've got all our engineers, which start from scratch from my drawings, or actually 3D drawings done by Eric Giroux, and then from there transform that into reality. Hmm. This is a process which could last anything between two and three years. Um, of course, now we've built over 20 calibers uh, a box of units we can actually reuse from time to time. So we've got four regulators. Mm -hmm. Before we had nothing, we had to restart everything from scratch. So as we go, life is becoming slightly easier. I'll give a good example is the Bulldog. So the Bulldog took about two and a half years of R&D, but if it started from scratch, it'd probably taken six to seven years. Mm. We'd already created the flying balance wheel in the Legacy One. We'd already created the vertical power reserve in the Legacy One. We knew how to work with the domes in the Frog, the case, which is incredibly complex. We'd have done already HM6, HM4, etc. So all that knowledge concentrates here and we can allow, allows us to come up with all our next ideas. So creativity opens up through uh, yeah, past and, creativity. And the more you create, the, the faster you are, the better you are, but the more, as far as we go, we want to explore different territories. Hmm. Because, as I said before, um, doing the same thing doesn't interest us. Hmm. What we're interested in is that extra, oh, we've never done that. Let's try that. And the other thing is, an artist can create a beautiful painting there's no after-sale service. When we create a piece of mechanical art, we have to ensure that it works for decades, and if it doesn't work, then it can be repaired in the next 100 years. So there is this insane responsibility which goes with engineering something complex. Hmm. So what's being worked on on these computers? So what are we uh, working so, on here? So, so typically, um, we, we will start from a base plate, and then start constructing and putting all the different gearings, and of course the regulator, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, different functions. It's not something I can explain like that in, in, in two seconds, but it's, it's a whole process. Um, sometimes we will only modify something which is existing, which doesn't happen often with us, as we really start off pretty much from scratch. 
and something like the HM9 that you see here, the HM9SV, is oh, it's probably one of the most complex movements we've ever done. We also design the movement to look like a work of art. You know, most mechanical movements are round, or maybe rectangular, or tonneau. Our movements, especially in horological machines, mm -hmm. have to look, I mean, the HM9, the watch looks as if it's going fast. Therefore, the movement has to look as if it's going fast. So there's also 3D design which goes into that process. Mm -hmm. So all the team here, they've really improved over the years. Now they come up with really great ideas. Initially, we were like taking our, our pencils and go, oh, maybe we could do it like that, maybe. And now really, they, they work so well that they come and say, look, I've had an idea, we could do this, we could do that. And I rarely have to change anything now. So I see also like I mean, some of the cases as you're testing these out, you're 3D printing some of this work and... This is the process in between, it's the okay. creative process. So okay. um, typically this is one of the ancestors of my HM5 which we launched in 2012. You see it doesn't look at all like what it ended up looking like. Uh, so we test ideas, put it on our wrist, does it look cool? This is before we know if it's actually the engineering can be done. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we come to a project which, oh yes, we can do that. Here, typically, Bulldog, one of the first iterations, well, first, first 3D iterations, there were tons of drawings before that. We had the attachments which were like this, mm -hmm. it ended up not like that. We had a crown behind, ended up having the crowns in, in, the, um, in the haunches. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, we draw, we draw, we do 3D prints, but we don't involve the engineers before we're happy with the shape and, and the whole functions, and then we go in. So this is where you're talking about outside first, then you work in. So you'll start really here. Exactly. I mean, this is, and, exactly. Because you want to see how this would feel as a concept on your wrist. Exactly. And, and approve that, and then you move into the engineering to see if it's actually possible. There you go. Okay. There you go. And, this whole process, like, where do you get this inspiration to create some of these pieces? Because obviously there's so much influence outside of watchmaking. You're not looking inside the industry, you're looking elsewhere. Where is that? So, at the beginning it was very much psychotherapy for me. It okay. was like an autobiography. <laughs> I was a lonely kid who used to dream of being a car designer, so there was car inspirations. Mm -hmm. I used to make model airplanes, so there was that. Um, I used to be a Han Solo or Luke Skywalker when I was a kid, so there were spaceships. So there was a lot of that in the first 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then I slowly, slowly grew up. And, um, and you, you'll see, for example, HM11, which is coming out soon. That's a whole new inspiration, it's architecture. So hmm. that's a more adult um, thing which I, I fell in love with and which inspired me to practically 18 years later come up with something. So that's for horological machines. On legacy machines, it's different. Horological machines, it's no boundaries. Let's do something incredible, kinetic 3D part. On legacy machines, it's let's say thank you to the great master watchmakers of the 19th and 18th century. Those who enable this industry to exist. Those who made every single innovation that we're still using today. Hmm. From the chronograph, the minute repeater, the perpetual, etc., etc. So let's go and get those incredible calibers and do something 3D, but we hope they would be proud of. Hmm. So uh, horological machines come from the gut, Legacy machines come uh, much more From the brain, intellectual. cerebral, got so, it. So, uh, it's weird, I'm very schizophrenic in my creative process. All right, Max, we have some incredible pieces in front of us. We have legacy machines, horological machines. We have a fun little treat at the end, which I would tell everybody at home to stick around for. But where do we want to begin? I think we have to start with horological machines. They're, okay. they're the foundation of MBNF. Uh, the idea was watchmaking is art. If it's art, let's do 3D kinetic art pieces, which, by the way, give you time. Now, I, am, I worship watchmaking and beautiful watchmaking, but giving time, even though it, they are actually very precise, is not the point. Hmm. Because we know it's not the point. So it was like that exploration, HM1, 2, 3, etc. We're now to, up to HM10. Here we've got HM8 Mark II, HM9 SV, and HM10. So they're three very different animals. HMs, every, every HM is very different one from the other. So it's not like a brand. It's, it's a complete creative lab. Take HM8 Mark II. I wanted to be a, a car designer when I was a kid. And this was really designed as if it was a car. You've got the, the profile of a car, the engine on the top, which is actually winding it up. Mm -hmm. And 
like a dashboard over the hours and minutes. What I love also, um, we're very serious about watchmaking, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. Um, this typically is like a magical uh, optical illusion. The movement is flat and prisms in sapphire are sending the information vertical to your eyes. So those di they're, they're discs at the bottom? So they're discs underneath. So they're sitting flat. So exactly. if you look down at the watch, it is looking directly up at you. Look at, that. look at that. You can really see it so well. When you would look straight in, you're, a mirror is reflecting it up. So almost like a camera you know, shooting exactly. up. And so on your viewfinder, exactly. see the time. So you have one for the hours, one for the minutes. minutes. It's a jumping hour, which mm -hmm. is you can go back and forwards. It's a sweeping minute. Uh, the case is incredibly complex. It's a titanium container, which is completely water resistant, on which we fit these carbon macrolon carbon. It's a, it's a new material which was created for us, which is basically macrolon is polycarbonate enhanced with carbon. And, uh, and it's machined, it's not molded, it's machined exactly like steel and then set upon it. The sapphire on it with the double bubble, a bit like Zagato, uh, is I'm very sure it's a nightmare. And we, we were supposed to deliver about 40 to 50 this year and I, I think we're barely at eight after seven months because we don't have the sapphires. Wow. But that's our life, that's normal. So that's HM8 Mark II. You want to go absolutely <laughs> bonkers HM9 SV is probably the craziest watch I've ever designed. So of course we got a lot of hate on social media for this. People who like 36 millimeter vintage watches have heart attacks when you see something like this. <laughs> but that's not the point. It's creating a sculpture. So HM9 is, is called the flow. It's inspired by uh, planes and cars of like the, the late 40s, early 50s, when uh, engineers had no wind tunnels, so they would design cars and planes to look fast, but they actually didn't know if they were. And, um, and when we finished this project, which was initially in titanium, I looked at that movement, look at that movement. I thought, isn't it a pity that nobody sees the movement? So I looked at my team and said, look guys, let's make it in sapphire. And they looked at me and I was like, oh God. Here he is again. No way, no way, there's yeah. no way we can make this in sapphire. <laughs> So we started drawing it with like panes and putting panes of sapphire in it. It was absolutely ugly and hideous. And finally we found a way. Now this, these two blocks of sapphire, which you see on the top and the bottom, are about 200 hours of machining and yeah. polishing each. And the movement itself is a double balance wheel, which have at the center a differential, which is averaging out. Mm -hmm. So if one is going plus six seconds a day and the other one is going minus six seconds, the watch goes at zero. If one goes at plus 10 and the other one goes at zero, mm -hmm. it goes at plus five. So it's all the time averaging. It's incredibly complex to do. It's beautiful. And for this time, we managed to see the whole movement. We're only going to craft two times five pieces. They're complex enough. It's going to take us a year and a half to do these two times five pieces. It's pretty spectacular, isn't it? How many pieces of sapphire? So you have one block up here, one block underneath. You have and one central cylinder here and one in the front. And then the dial, that superluminova, so you're housing the superluminova within that dial as well? Exactly. And that would be sitting inside of your wrist. So as you would just... usual, like virtually all our horological mm -hmm. machines are driver's watches. Mm -hmm. You see the time on the side. Just because if it's 3D, what's the point of doing something 3D and putting a flat dial on it? So we tend to go for the vertical uh, presentation. So that's HM9 SV, HM10. This watch is absolutely bonkers. I'd never tried it on before today. And I'm like, there's no way I could wear this as a watch. But one of the big tests was I rotated around on my wrist and I saw nothing except the strap. It sat on my wrist and it was- I've got tiny wrists. Mm -hmm. So whatever I create, I, I need it to be super wearable. And so when we create these more or less big pieces, the challenge is it has to be comfortable. Now this, I will uh, tell you, I, I drew it in 2012 and it finally came out in 2020. So eight years between the original drawing and the end product. Yes, it took about a year to go from my original sketch to this. And then about two and a half years of R&D. And then I just procrastinated because I was thinking, are you nuts creating a watch which looks like a dog? I mean, I love it, but I'm thinking maybe you've pushed it a little bit too far. And so what you, why is it a dog? There's a brain, two eyes, and underneath the jaws, which open and close are actually the power reserve indicator. <laughs> Again, that makes me smile. 
most people look at them like, seriously? Uh, the, the haunches are two crowns and you've got the legs. Mm -hmm. The case is incredibly complex. The movement is, of course, our movement with the flying balance wheel. And you have something where you need to be courageous to wear this. And I love our horological machine customers. I mean, I love all people who, who love what we do, but people who dare wear pieces like that, I'm like, wow, you've got the guts. Because I had the guts to create it, you actually had it to wear it. It's, it's just craziness. It's absolute yeah. craziness, but it's incredible too. If you look at the curvature, the, and this is where you're starting to see a lot of this work that you do start to build on top of one another. And I was also talking with one of your team members, even this, like this balance staff, like how you do your split escapement, split escapement and, and how you're able to you know, see the lever right there. And that's how you're able to, in other watches, get it to the back side of the watch. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So we, we learn as we go. We mm -hmm. keep on testing, doing trials, trying stuff that nobody's ever done. Sometimes we fail. I mean, there is no innovation if you don't fail. And sometimes we find something and then we introduce it in the next iteration. Uh, it, it keeps on opening doors. Um, a lot of people ask me, like, are you not scared of not having any more ideas? And what's incredible is when you create for yourself, it's like this psychotherapy de facto. You, you learn what you like and as you grow older, there are things you like differently and you try different and it keeps on evolving. I've got so many more ideas than when I created MBNF, I had HM1. That's it. I was bonkers. I, I put all my money in the company. I had just the drawing of HM1 and nothing else. And I thought that was a good idea. <laughs> so now I've got, we've got over, uh, I think, nine projects in the pipeline, nine calibers. And, and I've stopped. I still draw ideas, because, but it's pointless because they're going to come out in 10 or 12 years. Let's go to Legacy, legacy machine. Machines. Yes. So Legacy Machines were launched in 2011. So the brand was launched in two, oh, well, I created in 2005, 2007, first HM. And the idea was my way of saying thank you to the great master watchmakers of the 18th and 19th century. And I am, I'm sorry to say, a fetishist about balance wheels. Balance wheels are so beautiful. And up till the legacy machines, at the best, you would have a watch where there was a little hole in the dial, you can see a little balance wheel. The idea was to do this very, very large balance wheels, 14 millimeters, flying on top. And of course, everybody said that oh, that can't work. And we made it happen. That was the very first LM1. What we have here is the 101. Mm -hmm. So that LM1 came out in 2011. This is 2014. This is the most pure expression of a legacy, meaning hour, minute, power reserve, and this enormous flying balance wheel. We added on top of that in 2021, the beautiful double hairspring from our friends from H. Moser. Mm -hmm. And the movement was designed with our friend Kari Vutilainen. The, the beauty of the movement, the finishing of the movement is incredible between the red gold chatonnet, the beautiful hand, everything is hand angled, mm -hmm. hand engraved, etc. And what's interesting is that when this came out in 2014, it didn't sell at all. Hmm. It didn't sell in 15, in 16, in 17, in 18, in 19. We, we kept on crafting like maybe 20 pieces a year just because we couldn't amortize the development of the movement because I needed to sell way more to amortize that development. And then suddenly in 2020, pandemic hits and the whole world goes, wow, that's the watch I want. And you're like, where were you guys for the last six years? Mm -hmm. and suddenly, and now, now there's these insane five, 10, 15 year waiting lists on this piece. We craft in steel 50 pieces a year mm -hmm. for the whole world uh, and, and they're, not it's, it's over hundreds, it's, it's virtually probably a thousand orders everywhere in our retailers. So that's, it shows that when you love something, when you create a product you're proud of, don't despair. It probably sometimes needs time. And at some, some point, people will wake up and say, wow, that's great. So that's, that's the one one. That's like a connection where I find you have that traditional watchmaking that you talked about, having reverence to that, but then also your own creation on it. This, to me, is one of those perfect fusions of that. You see Max, and you also see the traditional watch making, because it wears like more of a traditional it watch. It does. It's a 40 millimeter yeah. watch. It's, it's much th easier. I mean, it, psychologically, emotionally, it's not going to be too much of a, a leap to try and wear that mm -hmm. compared to something like this. Mm -hmm. they're, they're different animals, but they come from the same brain, which is interesting.
Okay. So you build on top of that, and now let's jump to some So talk about brain, um, these two are the uh, brainchilds of Stephen McDonnell, mm -hmm. who is the only genius I've ever met in my life. Hmm. He is extraordinary. He is like Beethoven who composed the Ninth Symphony while he was deaf. Meaning, Stephen McDonnell is an uh, autodidact. He didn't go to watchmaking school. He's a theology scholar from Oxford, self-taught. Yeah. And he, he just loves watchmaking, learned online in books, and created single-handedly two revolutions in the history of watchmaking. First, the perpetual calendar, which we came out with in 2015. He worked on it between 2010 and 20, 2011, 2015. And it's completely revolutionary. Not only is it absolutely stunning, the whole concept of how it works is completely different to all perpetuals. It's based on a 28-day month. Because his thought was, wait a minute, most perpetuals are modules you put on an existing movement. That movement wants to go to 31, the date, every month. And six months a year you're telling it, don't go to 31, I'll push you from 30 to the 1st, without even talking about the 28th or 29th. Why are we making a movement do something it doesn't want to do? Hmm. Hence, why don't we start with 28 days and then construct on it? But that means that the whole concept of the grand lever, everything which has been used in perpetuals up to date, can't work. And he invented it from scratch. And on top of that, most uh, perpetual users will tell you um, they're always petrified when they change the date. Oh, yes. Because you never know if you're at the wrong moment between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. where you can damage your watch. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, am I actually doing it right? So what did Stephen do? He put clutches on all the pushers. So it is, it's not as sensitive as the classic perpetual, but on top of that, if it's the wrong time, when you press the pusher, nothing happens. And then shh, the clutch closes and you can change it. It's just pure sheer so, brilliance. So smart enough. And then the benefit of the 28 days is there's just no instantaneous force snap that needs to happen and creating extra wear where not necessary. And on top of that, the, the, the jump when you go from 28, 29, 30 or 31 to 1 is retrograde. Mm. You see it, you, you, it flies back. So you don't have that jump forward. Mm -hmm. So all of these things he thought of himself, it was his very first movement he constructed in his life. Is 580 components. Mm. We've been crafting about, we do about 30 to 35 movements a year since 2015. And I don't think we've virtually ever, I think we had one come back because of a perpetual calendar issue in the last eight years. It's incredible. So that is his first brainchild. And then hmm. in 2016, he was invited at Dubai Watch Week to talk about that. It had come out in 2015 and we're having dinner and I just bought a Tiffany pocket watch uh, split second chronograph from early 1900s. And I was very proud showing on my phone. Now, look at that, isn't it beautiful? And he's like, yeah, mm, well, yeah. I'm like, okay, why? He said, look, honestly, chronographs and more importantly, split second chronographs make no sense. First of all, all um, movements hate friction. And every chronograph in the market, when you start it, you induce friction, which is going to get the amplitude of your balance wheel down, hence your performance, your pre precision. So just when you need to be precise, you're much less precise. And he says, don't start on a, on a split second with all the friction you're adding into it. The precision is terrible. I'm like, okay, so what are we going to do about it? He said, I've got an idea. This is December, November 2016, January 2018. He comes to us with a drawing of this, but more importantly, with the solution to create the very first chronograph where you don't lose any amplitude hmm. when you start it. And well, of course, we had to prototype it, test it, it worked. And then from there onwards, he invented a movement which is one movement with four different functions. Two independent chronographs, the split second, which is actually two chronographs on 60 seconds and 30 minutes, because except for the Lange double split, all split seconds have one minute counter, but not the second one. So you actually don't know where you are after two, three minutes between the two timings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that, that was much more intuitive. Then he created the first sequential chronograph. You can actually time lapse super easily. And on top of that, it's a um, chess tournament aggregator, which was the added bonus to this. 585 comes funny because they're like four components difference, but a completely different movement absolutely stunning in finishing, in, in design. 
And that was another of his brainchilds. And it took five years. It got the Aiguille d'Or at uh, the Grand Prix d'Orgerie of Geneva last year. So you have on both sides traditional stop start exactly. in both of these positions. You have your resets. And then also what you can do, as we were talking about the chess, is cycle back and forth between the running chronographs. Exactly. Exactly. So it could go back with one button. So. The, and, and all of that without using any amplitude. And it virtually, even the, the power reserve virtually doesn't change if you've got both chronographs on hmm. or off. And so that, those are a few examples yes. of what we do. These are all movements which are still in production. Mm -hmm. We still have the split escapement um, uh, legacy. And then in the middle of all that, at some point in my life, I realized I'm creating beautiful works of art. I'm incredibly proud of. I work with people who are extraordinary. But the people I love, my friends and family, cannot afford what I do. And that's been gnawing at me. And in 2014, I designed this watch. <laughs> and I just didn't have the courage to come out with it. Because when you create these handcrafted, finished, beautiful pieces at 60 to 200,000 or more dollars, you don't go into an industrial product at three grand. And so I kept this in a drawer, 2014 till 21, when I finally had the courage to launch it. It's not an MBNF, we call it MAD Edition. MAD is Mechanical Art Devices. Because of the MAD Gallery, it's an edition from the gallery. And we crafted originally like 400 pieces for friends and family and the tribe members. I mean, all MBNF owners and all the, the people who'd helped me during at that time, the 16 years of the company. It was my way of saying thank you. Thank you guys, you were there for me. This is a little treat I created for you guys. We didn't talk about it at all. We just sent an email out. There was no social media. There was nothing on our website. And of course, at some point, somebody found out and the world went <laughs> ballistic. And I understand that they were all our fans. I mean, we've got, I think, on Instagram, we've got over 300,000 followers, all organic, and we've got incredible engagement. People love what we do. And they were saying, like, wait a minute, you're finally doing something I can afford, and I can't buy it. What is this thing? So we got so much backlash. At some point, I said, OK, let, let's do a small series for the public. Uh, but this is, we don't want this to be a business. We don't want this to be a brand. It's like a side project. And so we've, over the last uh, year and a half, done um, two raffles. We, we, we've tried a raffle system to be as fair as possible. And the last two raffles, we had like, the last one we had 1,500 pieces in the raffle and there were 19,000 people who signed up. And we're going to do, well, this week is the green. So we've had the blue for only the friends. The red, red is finished and we're introducing the green. Now, what is this? It's a movement which has been an industrial movement, which has been put upside down with this really cool tungsten and titanium rotor, which turns like a fidget spinner <laughs> on the top. It's a Miyota movement. It's a Miyota base. It's unidirectional. That's why, because mm -hmm. we, we got a bit of backlash, like, why are you using a Miyota? It's the only industrial movement which is unidirectional that we found to date. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, it doesn't turn that fast. It just goes, it wouldn't be that much fun. Now, the Miyota is modified because there is no way the Miyota would make these aluminium cylinders turn. No. It, it doesn't have it. So we've had to modify it. It's mm -hmm. modified in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And then we assemble everything here in Switzerland and test it and then deliver them. So how do you read the time on the sides also? It's, it's like an HM. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the hours and minutes, which are cylinders on the side through this glass capsule. The construction is pretty incredible because there is not one screw anywhere to be seen. It's completely seamless. And, um, and honestly, you get a lot for 2,900 francs. I think one thing that happens to a lot of people is they get so fixated on, oh, what's, what's the engine, what's the movement? And then they don't think about the other aspects. You, know, you look at this wash, you see this lug design, which is you know, very unique. I mean, clearly structured in a way that was given a lot of thought and finished very well for an industrialized product. You look at sapphire, you look at the finishing also on the inner edges of the look rotor. The finish, I mean, you, you, you look, see. At, look at the glass capsule. I mean, everything is way more complicated than a simple round watch with a dial. Yeah, and, and ultimately, I think it summarizes a concept. What I like about you is, you know, you're just, you're making fun things and things that interest yeah. you. And I, I think also 
wherever you stand on some of these watches, I don't think whether or not you want to own them is the important concept. And when I started walking in here, what I wanted to make very clear was this is a pursuit of passion. It's a pursuit of asking why. It's a pursuit of just pushing things forward in your own way. It doesn't have to be a right way. It doesn't have to be a wrong way, but it's your way. And it's your way of self-expression. And that's something to be admired, in my opinion. Thank you. Of course. Honestly, for when I created MBNF, I thought the whole goal of my life and as an entrepreneur and a creator uh, was to create great products. And I spent so much time, I was, I was sort of geared up, if you don't come up with a solution, you're probably part of the problem. And so it was like, let's find solutions, let's find, let's find, let's go. And you, you don't stop to think, am I doing right or wrong or should I have done? It's like, let's, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And then suddenly after 15, 16 years, you look back and you realize actually what was much more important was the two journeys. The journey, the creative journey of going from an HM1, which I thought was the coolest watch ever I'd created and look where we've come today, where I didn't have any of those ideas at that time. And the human journey of all the people who've crossed our paths and we've worked with and we've had so much fun with. And, and if you just look at what we just launched on Only Watch, the um, collab with our Moser. friends from H. Moser, um, we had a really great collab in 2020. We had so much fun. We were like, okay, let's do something together. We engineered a minute repeater piece unique movement over two years, like sweat and blood to get there in two years. And we're only going to do one movement and we're giving it to charity. Now, honestly, in the last months, I'm thinking, what have I done? But at the same time, I know that when I look back, I'll be so proud that we did that. And we had so much energy, positive energy working together. So the journey is the goal. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, Max, and uh, showing us the window into your timepieces, the window into your mind. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, because honestly, um, your YouTube channel has helped educate so many more people uh, and enthusiasts and I'm a hyper geek, so I, I love it, but I think you've brought so many more people who are just a little bit mildly interested to get way more interested in our world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Max. It was a pleasure. Likewise. Okay.